I suppose I can start us off. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say that we're really looking forward to this being a spontaneous and informal conversation. Um, the five of us know each so some of us know one another, some of us are meeting for the first time, some of us have collaborated on different kinds of projects at different moments, um, and we're hoping that our dialogue today can just be, you know, a chance for us to talk about ourselves and share that with you all, you that we can't see. Um, and if any questions come up, I believe with the webinar function that folks can put questions in the chat or the Q&A, and so we'll try to keep our eyes on, on that. Um, maybe we can begin before we really dive into our questions by each introducing ourselves briefly. Um, Nicole, will you go first? Yes. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a e-textile artist and a creative technologist. So I work a lot with different machines, ranging, you know, from knitting machines to sewing machines to Arduinos, and I do a lot of installation work. Awesome. I will pass it off to Perlin. Hi, I'm Perlin. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist and designer, and my practice focuses a lot on personhood, what I call neo-mythology, and the divine feminine. And um, really, a lot of my work is a fictionalization of the plight of the human experience. And I usually draw from science and fiction um, through embodied performances, augmented reality, and video installations. And I'll pass it off uh, to Emma. Um, awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Emma. Um, similarly, I'm also an interdisciplinary artist. So I work with scientists, law and policymakers, environmental environmentalists, and um, I'm at that intersection of non-human cultures and human culture and how they influence one another um, and create new technologies and how cultural evolution can be rapid or gradual and how I can display that through art. I also work a lot with materiality um, and textiles, weaving. And so I look to the environment for my materials or my co-creators. And so trying to think about that relationship between other elements in the environment and how we interact with it um, or work against it. Hi, I'm Stina. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm an interdisciplinary artist as well. I'm my, my primary um, medium is fibers, but it's changing as well. It's always changing, I find. Um, I focus, a lot of my work focuses on um, Black archives and also on data and migrational work and more so on just like the idea of how tales get woven into stories and um, yeah, things like that. Super. I'll introduce myself. I'm playing a double role as our moderator and as a, as a participant. Um, my name is Victoria and I am working primarily with textiles and in particular um, weaving textiles, but I like to use my woven materials in the form of objects, in the form of stories, and um, I make pieces that go on the wall and hang from the ceiling as installation, including um, a work that Nicole and I have made collaboratively that's at Culture Hub now in New York and in LA, um, as well as things that are a little bit um, less tangible or in other formats um, like a book documentary and other sorts of um, social practice kinds of projects. Um, so I think I'll start us off um, by asking everyone to, you know, we can just start a discussion about machines. So I think we all work with machines in, in different kinds of ways, both literally, um, we're using them right now, we're using them to create objects, to generate stories and information, to share those objects and stories. Um, but then we're also, I think all of us thinking about the machine as a concept in other ways. Um, maybe I'll pass it off to you, Emma, first, because you've actually made a machine that is on view at, for Culture Hub. But, you know, from there, I'll, I'll just invite us all to chime in with any thoughts and personal um, questions or comments on that topic. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. Um, I think this is a really fascinating topic. Um, I'm making a machine that's made with machines. <laughs> and if you think about it, weaving is just that that thing, right? So we created a loom, we had the punch cards, we created the code for it. 
And then we created a machine, a computer that we can then use to create weavings. <laughs> so everything is full circle. And I think of that, um, speaking of circles, my loom is not a traditional loom. It's a four shaft cylindrical loom. Um, so it has four umbrella-like structures um, that open and close to reveal fibers um, that are also inspired by kumihimo loom or a braiding loom. Um, and so it's about seven feet tall, I'm showing it at this weekend at ReFest in LA. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to make like, it's gonna, the final product will probably be like a five inch by three foot weaving. Um, and I'll make several of those. And the concept behind it is more biological. Um, so I was thinking about culture and its relationship to nature and the things that we find in the environment. So as weavers, um, I mean, maybe this is a topic we can go down, we don't have to go down, but sourcing things from nature, right? So dyes, um, the fibers that we have, it could be silk, it could be wool, it could be so many different things. And it's, I think weavers are in this position to really understand how to work with the environment. And so I'm really excited by, about that interface. Um, and I think that machines are just another iteration of that. Um, even machines are natural. So a computer in front of us is natural. Think about all the alloys, the metal, um, that was used to create it. Um, and so it's it's a lot of coding, it's a lot of thinking, but it's also all natural materials um, that I kind of drive home through making machines and working with machines. Um, so it kind of became, becomes this symbiotic relationship where it's less about like technology taking over us and more about that intimacy and connection to te technology through the history of tools and how we've used tools um, since the beginning of time. Um, <laughs> so so narrow focus, I'm working on the cylindrical loom, but broad focus, we're all in a system and that system, we're working with it. And sometimes we're not working with it in the best way. So um, that's how I, I pry into that. And I'd like to pass that off um, to whoever would like to continue that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll jump in because what you're saying, Emma, about working with the environment uh, resonates with, with me and my work. Um, but more specifically, I'm working more with biodata um, in my work where um, in the genetic opera, we, um, you know, send um, our DNA um, from our saliva to a lab in Berlin, and they se they're sequencing a very specific site of our DNA, the HRV1, which links back to matrilineage. And this was, this project was a way, um, reverb, um, was a way from me and many people to connect with their matrilineage in a unique way and to hear it through song. And so we give data meaning when there is, you know, I think some sort of like artistic or poetic translation of that. Um, and, you know, there, I feel like there are different ways um, in which we, you know, um, take from either, either the environment or from, you know, biology to, to do so. Um, and, you know, speaking of machines, in the very early part of this project, we um, wanted to see if we can sequence DNA in real time. And so there's this machine from Nanopore um, Tech, and it's called the Min Ion. And that was really one of the first machines you could, that was portable, and you can sequence um, your DNA in, in real time. And this was um, quite interesting for us to, um, you know, discover. But at the same time, we kind of uh, thought like, oh, well, we need time to like compose like the, an opera from um, the nucleotide. <laughs> so we can't really, you know, this machine that is real time is amazing, but maybe it's not always like the right uh, complete fit for the project. And so we were re really looking at um, various different tools and reconfiguring um, as we go, which was um, quite interesting to the process. Speaking of that, Perlene, um... I was looking at migrational data sets um, in statistical records in like StatsCan or World Bank to just like weave stories of like my ancestry, my family or Caribbean people. Um, mm -hmm. And although it was like the starting point, nature came in because of like, that's like the quanti quantitative side of research, but then there's a qualitative side that is missing in the data sets. And like, I have to bring in elements of my environment in order to make sense of it. And so that it shows a whole, a wholer picture because the problem with data sometimes is that it's, it's, well, it's not sometimes it's full of bias. And so mm -hmm. like questioning new questions come into existence when we know um, the stories of our environment, of the people that we know. And if we're connecting that to the data, then in comparing it, or we can have a fuller story. So it works both, maybe not in a machine learning way, but in a way of like, 
data on a techno technological side and then also the environment in terms of family and the, the environment of people we know and connecting those two stories together. It's interesting to hear both you, Perlin and Stina, talk about, you know, machines, but also people within the machines. So, you know, thinking about family lineage or ancestry, um, something I think about a lot, I've been using a knitting machine as kind of the communities around machines. Um, people build the machines, people use the machines. And so who are these people and, you know, what are their stories, but also what kind of knowledge are they they holding and they're archiving and they're passing on to new generations and how can we look to our past for this type of knowledge around machines. Nicole, that's such a, a good segue to for us to move into our next sort of topic. And I think I'll say like, you know, once a topic is out there, it's fair game. So please continue to share thoughts on machines. Um, but, you know, this idea of um, integrating stories into our physical objects is both literal and physical in our installation, Nicole, Ancient Futures, um, that's on view in both the Refest locations. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit more, Nicole, and I, I can piggyback too, and just the ways that for that project, um, the idea of something can be both literally woven and, and storily woven in. Yeah, so a bit about Ancient Futures. It's a participatory installation and it's a triple woven installation and it has fiber optics that are woven into the installation. And you can walk up to the piece and tell it a story. And it will take the audio, translate it to speech, do a sentiment analysis on it, and then take the mood of that message and reflect it back in light. And the idea is that over time, the kind of mood and um, ambient nature of this textile will um, change and be dynamic and reflect the communities it lives within. And so, you know, just thinking about how all of these, um, just how stories can be reflected in, in different ways and how textiles have traditionally held these stories and held this data. Yeah, I think one of the things that really inspired us as we've been working on this project from the very beginning is looking to the history of objects that have held information and in particular the textiles that have done it just to repeat what you've what you've just said Nicole and there's so many examples that we have already encountered that have inspired us. I'm certain that there's many, many more that we haven't yet mm -hmm. encountered that will continue to sort of fit this rule. Um, and in learning about the work of Perlin, Stina, and Emma, it seems that you all are also exploring this, like what it means to reference an object that can hold meaning. I know some of the works that we're looking at um, are ones where the actual knitted pattern is it corresponds to some sort of binary code that can be translated into an English language, which of course has its own uh, meaning and communication. So I'm curious if anyone else is um, working that literally. I think, Stina, that you are in some of your woven works and translating data into patterns. Maybe you could tell us more about that. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, with the data sets for the Black Caribbean Migration Project, um, it was really inspired off of a conversation I had with a good dear friend, Alani, in Berlin. Um, she introduced me to the book of W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Visualizing Black America. And I think when I got a hold of that book in 2018, I was really blown away by just the idea of somebody taking the time to document Black life. Um, and it was presented in a way that I could understand it, like, visually. But it left such an impact on me in thinking like, wow, this person really went out there, collected all this data, and then created these beautiful data sets. And I'm like, I wonder if that would be possible to do with like the migrational experience in Canada. Um, and at first, the idea of uh, collecting data for all of Black life in Canada just felt like a huge feat. So I, I, I summed it down or I scaled it down to just like the Caribbean population. And in that it became, it's, it's been kind of hard because we haven't done a, a great job at keeping records or records and data are just hard to find. If I put it in more kinder terms, <laughs> it's just harder to find the data that I was looking for. I was looking for data on education or home ownership success stories, basically. When a lot of the data um, documented is data that doesn't really show 
um, Caribbean life at its best, or it shows a lot of more things that I think that it's harder to shift or tell a story with that. But the literal representation um, of the data is to, or the challenge I'm finding is to also make it beautiful and to make it um, not just a bar graph that we're looking at that you could do on an Excel sheet. And so I'm working with a data scientist, Tim Shoup, who uses a program called R and to like figure out new ways of visualizing the data using artistry and other tools like that, which I'm slowly learning as well. And so those are like, um, those are actual renderings of the work. And then oddly enough, through those, through looking at pure data, I've started to, to create my own data sets for other works that I'm working uh, like alongside of that research. And one of them is a, a work in progress that I'm working on that's really about my ancestors. And it goes more into like the realm of mythology and folklore. And, and so this idea of this data that I couldn't find that I am, but I'm still working with data sets that I do, I can find, but then now creating new data sets for stories that don't exist yet or that only exist in my dreams or in my mind. And so this idea, I think they work really well hand in hand. So it's like playing with real data and then also creating new data and new archives of my experiences. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. And there's something about the way that you articulate it that um, kind of brings me to one of the other questions that we'd prepared today, which is um, this question of responsibility. You know, when we're telling stories, we're responsible after we've added our own um, voice to it for telling that story accurately. But what happens in the case of the data that you have been working with, Stina, that it doesn't have the full picture? And how can we as artists like fill in the blanks or you know, there's so much to be said on that and the, the responsibility of stewarding stories um, through our own objects and voices. Um, it makes me feel curious to ask both Emma and Perlin about like your your experience with the responsibility of the um, natural materials that you're working with. And Perlin, you were telling us before about like the actual um, bio materials that you're collecting. Um, and maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on sort of the responsibility that you experience or that you focus on in working with that? Yeah, I mean, I really resonate with what Stina said, um, you know, really about, um, and also your work, Nicole and Victoria, about the kind of these collective stories. Um, and um, for, and I think with working in DNA, you're kind of telling untold stories. And I mean, specifically, um, you know, my relationship to my grandmother, who is 108. Um, and yeah, she's wow. like a trooper, still going. And, um, but I had found out only recently that she raised a village of orphans in south, the south of China in her, you know, early teens. Um, and that meant that my mother was adopted. And that mean that meant my grandma was not biological or blood related to me, but she had raised me for so much of my life. And so I I was finding, um, you know, kind of her story is one that is untold, but it is not untold when, you know, I get to sequence my DNA and then find out that through my HRV1, that we all share 1% of our uh, bio data to the mitochondrial Eve, who is the first document women on planet Earth. So she's, she originates from Africa and we all share some of her DNA, um, very little, but that means that I didn't, I didn't just find out that I was connected to my grandmother anyway, but that we're all connected. And I think that was um, just something that unfolded in the process naturally that was even kind of better than um, what I was seeking. Uh, which was to feel very related as much as possible to the woman that had raised me. That's such a, a lovely story, Perlin. Um, I, Emma, I see you unmuted, so I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm also just really absorbing everything everyone is saying has just as, I, I mean, I don't know if I can speak for the people who are listening to the webinar, but I feel like I'm getting just as much out of this discussion. So I'm really excited about it. And um, I think art has this tremendous ability to tell stories um, that is reflected in everybody's work here um, that I'm really excited about. And um, I can particularly relate to the, the DNA aspect. 
um, right? So DNA being a relatively new um, technology and there being a lot of um, concern about how DNA was found, who has the rights to DNA. There's a, there's a lot of tension there and a lot of responsibility when working with biodata. But I think the wonderful thing that, that can come out of this that Pearl is showing, Pearlin is showing us is that, you know, if we write the stories with the data, data it has so much potential um, to really bring home why, um, which was a question that somebody else brought up, not to like preemptively bring that question up. But I feel like to me, that starts to answer this why, why do we do this? Um, and I think that that has a lot of power behind it. Um, and in my in my own work, I've been working with DNA. I've been working with a scientist, Dr. Siobhan Braybrook in the UCLA Molecular uh, Cell and Developmental Biology Lab. Um, and so I've been looking at something a little bit different, uh, plant life uh, that's behind me in this. Um, my background is Macrocystis periphera or giant kelp. Um, this was in Southern Australia um, where scientists have planted like the last remaining kelp because of ocean warming becoming uh, so hot that the kelp can't survive anymore, but they've existed for um, millions of years. And so it's this question of like, do we take the place of that or do we try to find a way to live with it and use technologies? And so there's this huge, there's so many questions about responsibility right now, especially as it pertains to biotech. Um, but there is this kind of inspiration in knowing that at its origin with nature and with DNA, we can find connections to people and tell new stories, um, especially if we have the right people telling stories, because it really does matter who tells those stories. Um, and so my specific, um, I didn't look at the like feminine DNA, the thing that Perlin was talking about, but I was looking at the heat shock protein or that response. And it was really amazing to learn that every living being has a heat shock protein um, that responds to stress in the environment, uh, which could be heat, it could be toxins. And so um, elementally, we were all biological beings. And that gives me a lot of excitement to tell that story of how we're all connected and how we're connected to like literally everything around us because we don't exist without our environment. Um, so I'm sorry to keep drawing that home, but <laughs> um, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, we, we are five people here with such different practices, but I, I think that's something that we have in common, right, is the relationship or the inspiration to the world around us, um, natural or um, manufactured from nature or, you know, synthesized, whatever we like to call it. Um, it makes me think a bit about, Nicole, your prints um, and your practice and sort of taking patterns, plugging them in to a computer and generating new like flat visuals, um, that using the world around us, both as inspiration from a story point of view, but also finding the patterns in the, in the visual language around us. Would you tell us more about that project? Sure. Yeah, so, you know, just as people who paint use um, paint brushes or someone who draws might use a pencil, I use code a lot as my creative medium, medium. so it might be to drive an installation, but also to make things that are visual. Um, so I've done a lot of printmaking, but also translating those prints into physical objects such as um, knitted textiles. And I'm, the prints are very simple in that they're um, basic math equations that I'm expanding and plotting. Um, and they're just kind of, they're visual representations of these mathematical equations um, that translate into physical objects. Um, Emma, when you were speaking before, you brought up this question that we had all agreed we would address of, of the why. Um, you know, why do you continue to practice what you practice? Why do you do it every day? What drives you? What motivates you? Um, I think I'll say for myself, but I'm expecting that y'all might agree that there's, um, you know, a love-hate relationship sometimes with this work because it's so personal and you're so passionate about it, but that means that, you know, every waking moment is part of your work. Um, I wake up in the middle of the night and I have an idea, but I'm supposed to be sleeping. I'm not supposed to be working. Anyway, the, the motivation can be complicated, but we all really find a lot of um, inspiration and purpose from this work. So maybe each of us could take a moment to talk more about that, or if anyone has like a new question born from the topic of why, I'll throw it out to the whole group here. It's a big one. Tough so. one. Yeah, yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> well, 
I'll, I can jump in and, you know, feel free anyone to pay you back because this, this might resonate is that I think, um, especially when, you know, you talk about this kind of love hate relationship, it is really a sustainability um, to the practice um, and a dedication to it. So I think very much like um, a very symbiotic relationship or um, whether platonic or not, right? Like, I think it's, um, it is, a, it is a choice. Um, and the kind of this defiance um um and like i think i'm now thinking about i've been reading a lot of uh, about hildegard von bingen um who is like an abbess and she's like a benedictine of she's like i think around like in the you know 1098 like very you know um kind of high middle ages um she was really uh, ahead of her time um a botanist and and otherwise, but she talks a lot about this idea of um, how when when plants grow, they defy gravity and um, they, you know, thrive even against, you know, all kind of all odds, like the, the most kind of, um, you know, simple physics of, of this world. And I think that's kind of what um, sprouting a practice means, um, is that kind of d despite that resistance, um, you're still going to nurture your practice and, and yourself through that. Yeah. Yeah. When I think about why I always come back to this point of, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing is around community and community practice and storytelling. Um, that's a big driving factor for me. And within that, I've found um, maybe in the past two years that the best way to really nur nurture my practice is through collaboration. Um, so working with other people, um, such as Victoria and our collective craft work, makes it so much easier to nurture the practice and make work um, in a sustainable fashion. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback since you mentioned me, Nicole. I, I really mm -hmm. resonate with that too. And I, I think all five of us do. I, I know just in the conversations that we've had outside of this Zoom um, and that we've all collaborated in, in different kinds of ways. I, I'm inclined to plug um, a cookbook that Perlin has not given a recipe to yet, but hopefully she will for the second edition. Um, but Nicole, Stina, um, Emma, and I all have um, put recipes into this artist cookbook called You Stir the Pot that's going to um, be available in the summer, which I anyone who's listening, uh, you know, check it out. And we'll do a second edition and Perlin will have a recipe there, I hope. Um, but anyway, the, that is a project that's sort of born from this idea, Nicole, that you were describing. Like, I don't work in isolation um, anyway, but if I did, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, and so this idea that we can sort of put all of our creative projects together into something that we all share is, is a motivation for me personally and also helps me stay um, sane in the creative practice and in the why. Um, and I've also found that the projects that I'm able to do in collaboration are ultimately more fruitful than the ones that I'm doing individually. Like that idiom of you can carry more water in two hands together than you can in two hands separately. There's just so much more that grows from multiple brains. This conversation is so great. Um, yeah, when I originally saw this, this question, I had a, a similar response where I was like, I don't, I don't think I'm motivated every single day. <laughs> I would definitely be lying to you and to myself if I said I woke up every single morning and was like, this is a great day to work on this project. Um, sometimes it takes time. Um, there's two quotes that these might be a little cheesy, but stick out to me kind of a lot and kind of keep me pigeonholed and keep me going is um, inspiration finds you working. And the second one, uh, nature does not rush, yet everything is accomplished. Um, so just to know that, you know, there, there can be a sustainability, sustainability to the practice, but it takes just showing up to it and acknowledging what's going on. And some days nothing's going right. <laughs> and some days everything is going right. And it's amazing. And it's a euphoria. And it can also be a meditation. Um, it can, can offer a space to work on something and think of something so tremendously deeply that you exist through that thought, the, the thing that you're thinking about, that you're creating, that you're embodying through your work, 
that it's like the closest I've ever felt to touching a thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that feeling is so good. And I think that that keeps me going. Um, <laughs> it sounds a little weird, but um, yeah, touching your thoughts and doing that with other people too, like having the opportunity um, like this. I'm super grateful that Culture Hub put this on because it's not every day. Um, it's not even every week or every month that we get a chance to all talk to each other yet. Um, I don't know if I can speak for others, but I've heard about your guys' work before actually having met you. And so it is this small community. Um, and yet somehow the introductions don't always happen because I might be on the, the West Coast and you might be on the East Coast. And so I think that this is really where it's at. And collaboration is the sustainable practice part of my practice for sure. Um, without it, which I would probably get a little bit too caught up in that feeling of touching a thought. <laughs> and then also just thinking, right? So I think when people think of an art practice, maybe sometimes they suppose, oh, the art practice is it's a material thing. It's really just about the material. But more than that, I think it's about the conceptualization. It's about bringing people together. It's about thinking. And it's really importantly about asking questions, always asking why. I think if you had a, a an interdisciplinary group and you had a scientist and you had an artist um, and you, I don't know, had somebody else, an engineer, and you, you get them all together and they start talking, the artist is always going to be like, but why, but why, but why? And it's so <laughs> important. <laughs> you got to keep asking why. And so um, I think in itself, that question is the answer. Why do you do this is the answer. My answer is, why do I, why do I do this? <laughs> I agree with you, Emma. And just like how things intersect, like my desire to learn about data brought me to a scientist and then also brought me to like e-textile spring break where I met a whole bunch of other new people, a whole bunch of people who have now like made me think about sound or other elements that I had never even thought about in the past. So I agree about the idea of collaboration. There are times that I like to be working alone, like it's very meditative too. And that idea of touching a thought through weaving long hours. Yeah, that's great. But I need a break from that. I need to be in community as well. And so this is like a great opportunity to just like meet you all. I looked up all of your works before today and I love everything that you guys are all doing. So yeah. So I suppose we we can continue exploring this why for our, our lifetimes, um, but I, I'm grateful for all the thoughts everyone's shared. Um, and then, you know, Sina, your last comment, but I think we've all been touching on it today, um, makes me wonder about materials in general, um, you know, our relationship to materials. Many of us are working with materials that are intangible. Um, others of us are working with materials that we might be foraging ourselves. Um, I've also noticed that we got a question from someone in our um, group here asking about biomaterials and accessibility to those from an economic point of view, accessibility, you know, or how it, they can often be expensive um, and the limits in um, accessibility to them. So anyway, maybe we can start a conversation more generally about the materials that we use, where we get them and what, what we do with them when we're done, so to speak. But um, if anyone has thoughts, on this question about materials in the chat as well, feel free to jump in. I would, I'll jump in to just say lately, I've been, instead of starting from concept, trying to break that kind of art school routine of having to have a story and a concept before building and and trying to start at material. Um, So thinking about ancient futures, which is the piece up um, at Culture Hub in New York and LA, Instead of, we have a whole story around that, around data and how stories have been exchanged throughout time through textiles. But how we started that project was I wanted to explore fiber optics and Victoria wanted to explore a certain type of weaving. And so that was our point of collaboration. And so, you know, looking to materials as as inspiration has been a big part of um, kind of my process lately. I can can go off of that because I I really, really, really love that and appreciate that, that you guys both had your interests and saw each other and appreciated each other for what you offer and then just jumped into it. Not like we have to talk about this. We have to talk about that. 
Um, I think those kind of collaborations offer the best space to think together. Whereas if you have the concept already and go to somebody to collaborate, then they're just like, well, what do you want from me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think it's, it's, it's those moments where you can start from scratch with somebody and say, I don't know what we're making. This is what I do. That's what you do. We're cool. Let's do something. I think, I think it's really smart. Yeah, and the, for that project that Nicole is describing, we came up with a really conceptual work in the end, um, but it's very much the materials that got us started. And we, we found some stories that were attached to those materials as we were working with them. Um, and I would imagine that that's true for a lot of you all too, but I'm curious to hear more specifically like the, the particular things that you're working with with your hands, but then maybe we also interpret this question with the softwares that we're using, the languages that we're using, and the devices we're using. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm the black sheep here in terms of I'm not really working a lot with my, with my hands in particular, I'm not weaving, um, but um, I think a lot of what I draw from is actually my my body. Um, I do a lot of um, you know kind of these performances through AR, and um, part of it is you know I'm making a now a video game that you know is going to involve um, motion capture of of me and my body, um, and oftentimes you I find that you know I was just you know dancing in the studio um right out here and I find that like when I'm just moving like very particular ligaments in my body um I am you know kind of exhuming or extracting like some sort of tra trauma or like it leads me to think about a, a part of a very specific memory that happened to me and so it's not I think it's analogous to kind of looking the other way where you're not thinking about a memory first in particular or a concept first but then some part of experimentation and through making then you you know end up at some sort of story or concept from the, from that and i think that discovery is um is kind of scary actually because you have to have so much trust in your process and leading kind of into the unknown and there's this confidence and the security that you know that um, that you can trust the process and that you'll still get that same quality of work. Um, but I th actually find it much more liberating and um, you know freeing, like you're saying, Nicole, um, kind of you know taking off that like art school mode uh, mo mold and being able to kind of trust yourself. And I think that is um, an interesting evolution that I think we we're all kind of going through. I have to agree with that and um, the idea of going looking at the materials first. I've been making that shift slowly um, over the last year, especially after last fall at eTextile Spring Break, and we talked about the responsibility of materials um, there as well. Um, I'm I've recently been obsessed with paper, um, and there's the idea of a fiber that you can make that you can make out of other materials. Um, so uh, last year in February, during a residency, I made a whole bunch of paper out of denim. And so I went to like the, the thrift store and I, I got a whole bunch of denim and then I just made paper out of it. And just thinking of the history of denim and like and black identity and the history of cotton. And so really going back to reversing the way that we think about our art practice and starting with materials I haven't quite used it yet, but I've definitely made the paper and it's something that's like still stewing in my brain, how to tell a story with it now. But knowing that the material is such an important part of the practice in how we're creating our stories and tales. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you say that you haven't made anything with it. And I think that so much of having in a practice is having a ton of ideas you haven't made or a ton of explorations. Um, and so a thing that I've started to do um, and we've started to do in our collective is when we show work, we show the work in progress. We show the broken prototypes, um, often because we're, we're mixing materials that aren't found within the same space, you know, thinking about wires and textiles or resistors and capacitors and textiles. Um, you have to do a lot of experimenting. And through, 
through all of that, you have a lot of work that is not done, not totally complete, but that is worth looking at, worth talking about, and worth exploring. I really like this conversation. Um, there's so many little snippets of everything that I'm I'm carrying with me. Um, and also thinking about the question in the chat. Um, and so Stina mentioned thrift shopping and uh, somebody is asking this question, which I love to do. This is like the only way I get clothes actually. Um, uh, thrift shopping and then also um, like bio dyes and you know, pricing and like trying to get rid of petroleum. So for a long time, um, I was working with plastics and plastic threads, so synthetic nylon um, and poly like low density polyethylene. Uh, and it was just really, really gross and probably like bad for my health, breathing and all those fibers. Um, and it was all things that I found from the environment. So um, I would go out and we would do a research project, collect as much trash as we could off of remote beaches uh, in on the Southern California Channel Islands, bring it back. We would collect like an entire huge, like one of those dump dumpster truck trash cans. Um, and I would just kind of scavenge for things. Um, so trying to think of the objects that I can get directly from the environment that don't involve stepping through a store or having an economic kind of exchange or a monetary exchange um, is really interesting to me. Um, so that could be something like, you know, buying all cotton shirts at a thrift store and then going home and collecting onion peels for a month and then dyeing it with onion peel. And then you have a nice like yellow tannish shirt. Um, so these kind of options to like it's really nourishing to try to find those kind of relationships to, oh, I'm cooking and I have all this waste. What do I do with that? Or, oh, I just thrift shopped and there was a shirt for a dollar. So I'm going to like put those two together and try to find those connections. Um, the most recent example of material, like letting the material, like just being vulnerable to the material telling me where to go. Um, I was on the beach and I don't know if you guys have seen those clams that bore into rocks. Um, they're, they make like perfect, perfect holes in rocks. And I'm making this cylindrical loom and I was like, oh, like I really need rocks as a warp. Like, so like it's a warp weight, weighted loom, um, which is a very ancient technology. And so I found these rocks that these boring clams had drilled into. And I was like, perfect. I don't have to drill any rocks. Yes. I can just borrow these rocks from the beach um, and use it for the loom. So in, in a way it's really, it kind of just like augments that, that relationship and that connection. Um, and just trying to understand how everything comes together in a system. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate all these anecdotes and um, I also appreciate the question that's been asked. I think it's important that we kind of name the um, bigger systems beyond us that are at play and sometimes accessing the sustainable material is a privilege in and of itself. Um, and holding accountable the industries that are creating these materials and you know doing what we can with what others have already wasted while also you know advocating for more ethical sustainable practices um, which is probably a bigger topic than we can nail down in this one hour together but I, I like to name it just to recognize that you know both things can be true right like we can be experimenting with materials that might have petroleum origins. And then we can also be advocating for those materials to be regulated in different ways. I, I've been trying to sort of check myself as I use materials and as I go to make sure that I'm doing it responsibly, but also not um, limiting myself so far that it becomes my responsibility and you know, putting a lot of that energy into advocacy work too. Um, I want to I'm looking at the clock and we've got about 12 minutes left, so I want to make sure we address this next question that we've received about archives um, and then maybe we'll naturally um, find our way into just questions of what's everyone got going on what's coming up next in our practices creatively. Um, and anyone who's interested in like following along with what we're doing what what might they like to look out for so just to start um, we've got this question about documentation storage um, and interacting with work you know how do we deal with our work once it's been archived or completed um and nicole i'm inclined to pass it to you actually to start i want to hear from everyone but just because i know you um and i together but but you specifically are really interested in swatching and like collecting the process and creating objects um as an archive along your journey or the archive itself as an object so maybe you could tell us more about that Sure. So for those of you that don't know what swatch making is, it's traditionally a textile based practice. 
um, where you have a small sample of a, let's say, piece of fabric where you might be testing materiality, you might be testing um, how different materials work together, or maybe something that is uh, more of a technique test or an aesthetic test. Um, so like I mentioned before, oftentimes working with materials that aren't found in the same space. So for example, maybe I'm knitting on my knitting machine, but I want to um, knit conductive yarn in it. There's not a ton of patterns on that. So, you know, making a bunch of experiments um, that are testing these materials, but also testing the technique as well as the pattern and then saving all of those in a book. So, you know, if Stina or Perlin comes to my studio, they can easily look at that archive, see kind of the process I went through. Um, so it's a great way of sharing both for myself, but for other artists and making it kind of a public display of work. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious if uh, Perlin, Stina, or Emma, do you all do that type of swatch making? Um, actually, early in the projects when we we actually made this like um coif that you would wear um and that was going to be a celebration of mitochondrial even we had to swatch for the hair <laughs> um because um you know actually we were thinking about like oh should it be human hair should it be like synthetic hair and we were like looking at all different types of materials and um actually how to um braid the hair onto the 3d printed material that we had um and so like we actually found um, synthetic hair was like a little bit easier to control, but we wanted human hair because we were talking about DNA and, you know, so it's like sometimes it's like this interesting balance of like, um, what are you trying to tell with the story uh, versus like how the material actually works like you, there is a way in which, you know, when we work on all work with all types of materials that the material wants to be handled in a certain way and sometimes mm -hmm. you you either go with that or if you want to intentionally defy that that's like another skill on its own um but then there's so many things to think about um you know like i feel like you know swatching is like a good way to do that because you're able to then um, experiment through so many different types of materials to find like what is the right balance um, for the project from you know a um narrative like a narrative point of view or a life cycle like you know how did this um, you know, material come to be in its life cycle and how does it relate to the project? Like, I feel like that's like the most kind of interesting part. Like, what are the, what's the implication of using this material in my project? I've tried so many times to keep a swatch book <laughs> and I failed at it terribly, <laughs> miserably. Um, but I definitely test, like Perlene, I definitely test out materials prior to starting a piece just to make sure like I know what I want to use and like what version of it do I like best. But I'm always, every year I'm like, I'm going to make a swatch book and have an archival book of all the material, like all the tests I've done. And somewhere in the middle of the year, I don't do that. <laughs> to be fair, I have a swatch bin. It's not a book yet. <laughs> Maybe that's what I need to do. It's my ADHD brain. I'll just be like, yeah, I'm going to do this big thing. And then, I'm, oh, what's over there? <laughs> yeah. So I forget about it altogether. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm very similar. I think I test things out. And sometimes they get saved and sometimes they don't, depending on whether or not I felt like they were a valuable sample. It could be like recreated. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I think I don't have much more to add to that. I kind of sh share a mix of the sentiments, um, that have already been expressed, but, um, it is to me, I think that's another project. <laughs> um, it sounds like another project to me, which maybe is the intimidating part of it. Um, so making that swatch book or just keeping a habit of collecting them. Um, I find that sketches are also great to, to collect and figure out for building things, um, and, you know, I've got like jars of things. Maybe those are my swatches, like random jars of things <laughs> of different minerals or um, things for, for mordenting fibers or like hibiscus or bark or whatever it might be that's like hiding in a cupboard. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I think for me, my my practice is similar to a lot of what y'all have shared. Um, and one additional thing I'll add is that there's something really great about this moment in time for artists and archiving in the sense that we have this ability to do our own archiving. You know, when you look back in time and the ways that artwork or other um, gener things that humans have generated has been archived, it hasn't always included the voice of the maker. Um, and we've seen over time that many of these institutions have put in efforts to correct the way that they display things. Maybe we'd like to see more of that in certain spaces, but it's just kind of a thing about now where we get to be in control of our own narratives. Um, it's very cool how we get to to do that. I know that it's not a skill that comes naturally for everyone, but the fact that we can each create an, a free Instagram account, for example, to document our work and let, letting that be an archive that's got our voice accompanied to it um, has been something that's exciting for me. And, and I think as an artist too, that just changes a lot about how you get to be a professional, whatever that word even means, how you get to be like a, bu a business person too. You've got this new level of accessibility to your own story um, that hasn't always been the case. And um, actually, I think I'll use that as an opportunity to answer our final question, and then I'll pass it to the rest of the group, which is, you know, what is everyone working on now? What is everyone working on next? Um, and so I have didn't even mean to, but set myself up for a great transition to my update, which is also um, an update for Nicole. Um, apparently, we <laughs> work on everything together. <laughs> um, but Nicole and I are currently working on a documentary um, that talks about the ways that craft has been archived. Um, and in particular, we're looking at the ways that knit, machine knitting education has been documented and archived on YouTube. Um, our documentary is currently in a fundraising stage. So if anyone listening is curious to learn more about that and potentially supporting us, we are super excited to see our community of supporters growing. And we can drop a link to that in the chat here. Um, Nicole, feel free to to add on to that or pass it off to the next person for their update. Yeah, I would say um, the documentary relates to this conversation in that it's a documentary about machines, um, specifically a knitting machine, and they've stopped making this knitting machine. So it's an interesting point in time where people are archiving how to use these machines. Um, and if YouTube and the internet wasn't around, we might not have this archive. Um, yeah, I'll pass it off. Also, I just want to say, like, congratulations for raising money in such a short time yeah. and like meeting your goal like that is like, yeah, gives us hope. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's been a, it, the community support has been tremendous and it means a lot to us. Yeah, I feel, you know, the film that you're making is for the community and I think it's for the community by the community and I think that's it's just anyway beautiful to see the support and love um and uh yeah I think um in terms of what's going on next um I am venturing into making a video game an experimental video game um about my matrilineage, lineage um and it's kind of this uh open world uh fantasy where it's it's first person but um, it's really based on um, Grotto Heavens, which is, you know, uh, what in ancient Chinese mythology we call kind of portals between worlds. And um, each of the grottos has to do, will play my genetic opera, but has to do with uh, revisiting my relationship to my mother um, and the, the complexities of that. Um, so that uh, is my first time making a video game um, exploring new tools. Um, so. Yeah, it's called Infinite Mother, if anyone's interested. But um, yeah, I would love to learn what Sina, Emma, y'all are up to. One question before we move on. Perlin, when's your next uh, opera perform performance? Oh, <laughs> um, it's uh, June 23rd, um, and it'll be on the MoMA stage, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, and actually, it will be the I think the last iteration of the piece I think ever on stage for for um, as far as I know. So, yeah, thank you, thank you for, for making me fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I look forward to seeing that. Seems yeah, I'm cool. excited. Yeah, um, for me, I'm delving into more data and text e textile work. 
And I'm actually going to be having a show in Berlin at ZKU in September this year with a sound artist, um, Abigail Toll. So exploring like textiles and sound, uh, a collaboration in the works and, um, and potentially new research around in near Detroit. So, yeah. So many exciting things happening. Um, yeah, I'm working on my my four shaft loom right now. It's got two shafts on it. Uh, lots of more time working on that. And then I'll start prototyping the weavings on it. Um, and so for the first project, I wanted to um, look at a DNA that codes for language and just start to do a kind of a performance of DNA where I say out the characters of the DNA and then literally translate it into a weaving um, based off of the proteins. Um, and so the idea is that I can speed up my, my recitation, like it'll be a recording of the, the gene. I can speed it up and then allow for mistakes in the weaving um, to show like very literally how culture can change based off of mutation. Um, so if I mess up, like just the way that DNA transcribes to protein, if I mess up that transcription into my weaving, then I can show, whoa, like, look, look how much biodiversity you get when like it, it's encoded in a different way. Um, so that's that's the the theme for the the first uh, weaving on the cylindrical loom. Um, so working on that through the summer, and then we'll see what comes next. Very cool. Awesome. What what a lovely set of things for people in our audience to look forward to. Um, well, we're two on the nose. Oh, two oh one even. Um, and so I I guess that brings us to the end. Um, I don't know if someone from Culture Hub is going to jump in, but I can just say on behalf of the five of us, like, th thank you for listening. It's so funny to talk to people that I don't see in the Zoom room, but we are grateful that you were here and thank you for your questions. And thank you, all of you guys for chatting together with, with me and for us to have this chat together. And thank you to Culture Hub for hosting all of us here today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. It was great to meet you. Thank you.